Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Over It podcast. I am Suzanne Kohlberg and today I am sans Christian. So for those of you on video, and if you're not on video, this is a, a uh, thing if we're in your ears to come watch us on YouTube. To represent Christian today <laughs> is my little pineapple. <laughs> and we are joined by the fabulous Julia. I've never actually pronounced your surname, so <laughs> I'll leave that to you. I'm not going to try to that. <laughs> And um, Julia, handing over to you, just introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, I'm Julia Mazzola, which is the Italian way of saying it. It's really Julia Mazzola is also um, doable. And I am a life coach for magic makers, basically helping people turn all their imaginative superpower and wishful thinking into real life practical magic that they can use in their day to day. I love it. I love it. And so to, I'm going to actually get some paper so I can write some notes because I realize I'm not very organized today. (laughs) What, Julia, are you over? You're on the Over It podcast. The stage is yours. Mm -hmm. What are you over? Yeah, I am so over people treating intuition as if it is a shortcut to an easy life, basically. I see a lot of people using thinking that if they become more connected to their intuition or if they become like ascended level of intuitive then it means that their life will be free of obstacles or free of difficulty or free of painful human emotions like anger and grief and fear and disappointment all of these things and instead the way that i see intuition is that it is a beautiful kind of guiding light for clarity on what is important to you in your life and your desires. I often I find that people I'll always tell my clients that you're not following your intuition enough. If you haven't followed your intuition and then been felt like you've been slapped in the face by the universe. (laughs) I love that. I love the description of using intuition as a way of avoiding difficulty like the thing that came to mind is like intuitive bypass it's it's like if i say you know people talk about spiritual bypass or um you know manifesting as a way it's kind of like toxic positivity it it all rolls into one it's like just because you're intuitive doesn't mean that you don't have shitty times exactly and doesn't mean that you're above like regular earthly desires you know at the end of the day we're all human and the human experience is what we're here for you know i really think that intuition leads us to opening ourselves up and accepting all these parts of ourselves so that we can be available to the breadth of human experience like i always say we can't you can't selectively numb so if you're trying to numb grief and anger and disappointment that ends up numbing joy, contentment, satisfaction as well. And so I find that intuition has always tended to lead me towards opening up to all of it. And the more that I've become more comfortable with sitting with everything, funnily enough, the less that becomes a problem in my life. And the more I'm able to really experience the joy and the wonder so much more vividly than I did before. And that doesn't mean that I don't get upset. It doesn't mean that I don't get angry. I feel all of those things. It's just that there's so much more spaciousness for all of that other stuff to come into. I love that. Totally random off the cuff question. Do you record meditations at all? I do for my clients. You have the most calming voice. I was like, I'd love to listen to Julia do a meditation. So, yes. Anyway, (laughs) back to the usual programming. The human experience. So, like, I love that. And the thing you're talking about, you know, ascended and stuff. The human experience. We all got to eat, all got to poop, all got to do, you know, all sorts of bodily functions. And I think so much of what we, like, obviously, we don't necessarily want to see all of those things, but it's funny how a lot of the things are curated for us, even, you know, reality shows, we don't see a lot of the humanness in a reality mm-hmm. show. And I think sometimes the, the the point that you made that we can't selectively numb, we also can't selectively avoid. 
Yeah. It's it's kind of like when we I'm thinking of, you know, we all have the days, I call them burrito days. Not that I'm gonna go and eat a heap of burritos, though that would be not necessarily a bad thing, <laughs> but as in get on the couch, roll up in a blankie, <laughs> turn on the TV, load up some game like, I don't know, Candy Crush and just numb out like burrito is in like on the couch, not wanting to do anything. But when you have those days, then you're also numbing out or unavailable for good things as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, I just, I love that description of numbing out also means numbing the joy. Yeah, and I find, especially with those kind of moments, like you're saying, the when the tendency to avoid is so strong, in what tends to happen, I think, um, especially people who do feel very spiritually aligned and intuitive, is that then they'll feel so much shame around not being able to, like, magic their way out of it, or not be able to be aligned enough to be able to feel differently. There is so much like internal gaslighting that goes on that you think you have created this horrible experience for yourself and you should be able to get yourself out of it. When that's just not true, you know, the this whole toxic manifestation narrative just pisses me off so much <laughs> because it makes people so ashamed of who they are and where they are, which means they spend all their time wanting to get out of it, instead of perhaps their intuition is leading them to how to be with yourself in this moment. How do you open up to what is present right now? And what, what attention does that need from you? Maybe it is, you know what, I want to be a burrito for the day. And doing that without any shame, doing that, acknowledging that this is what you require. And maybe it's, you know, when I want to be a burrito for 20 minutes and after 20 minutes, I'm ready to get up and do something else. And it's when you lose that access of listening to your body and listening to your intuition is when you start to feel so confused around what is it that you actually want. And then it just becomes a shame spiral of wanting to avoid all of those feelings. I love I love that description too, is in like allowing yourself to be a burrito for a day or for 20 minutes. Have you watched Shrinking? I haven't yet. Oh, so I've anyone listening, Shrinking is a TV show. Um, it's on Apple TV in Australia for people overseas. I don't know, Google where it is. Highly recommended. But in one of the episodes, the Harrison Ford type character, he speaks about, you know, feelings of grief. Um and how hard it is for us to allow ourselves to experience that. So he recommends setting a timer for 15 minutes, putting on your sad music or whatever it is, like allowing yourself to cry, to you know experience that for that time. And then when the timer goes off, the music goes off and go about your day. And you could do that for whichever emotion you're wanting to access. Like uh, Denise Litchfield and I, do you know Denise? I do know Denise, yes. She's Fabulous. Awesome. Shout out to Denise yeah. if you're listening. Um, <laughs> she and I went to a rage room. So basically they had the music and they had all sorts of um, crockery and um, some of the stuff. I was like, I can't, like I said to her at one stage, my grandmother had one of these when I was a kid. Like I can't, she's like, smash it. <laughs> do <laughs> it. Access that period of rage. Like, we had the room for 30 minutes. It was ours. Yes. And then afterward, just go about your merry day. But allowing yeah. yourself to be with sit with move through that emotion for a period of time because otherwise when we burrito or whatever it is and don't feel anything that can drag on it could be days or weeks and then it could interfere with sleep and functionality and all this sort of thing but when you actually allow yourself to experience or at least in my experience the emotion like 30 minutes of raising and smashing my body was done, if nothing else. But, you know, 15 minutes of sadness or actually letting yourself cry, yeah. it's a long time. Or or if that is too much for you, another thing I do, any Nicholas Sparks movie, if I need a good cry, mm. I put it on like yeah. a walk to remember or, you know, basically any. I'm not a notebook fan. Like I know everyone raves about that, but not that one. But like a movie that you know will mm -hmm. um, allow you to access that emotion. Disney, and let it move through to be you. honest. 
always makes me cry <laughs> no matter which disney it always makes me feel emotional but it's um that's i i love what you're saying there because i think so many people are so afraid of being overwhelmed by their emotions but that's the blog they're like if i let myself feel this then i am never doing anything again and actually conversely like the converse is true you know usually when you allow it to move through you and setting a timer is perfect for that that's when it feels actually you feel like you have more capacity to deal with it and i love that you brought up like the rage room because i think anger especially for women is something that people find so difficult to tackle like i find there's this really good girl narrative in the way that we've been socialized that you're not allowed to show your rage and you're not allowed to raise your voice and you can't come across as too aggressive so a lot of um the people that i work with and especially highly intuitive people because uh when you're very intuitive and empathetic you read the room so easily and you know what everyone is doing and what everyone's kind of feeling and you take it as your personal responsibility to make sure that everyone is okay <laughs> you're like a sponge you're like a sponge that sucks it all up and then holds exactly. it and gets bigger and bigger and the people i work with um you know with weight and stuff as well yes. you, what you're not expressing you're you know expanding to hold and then um yeah, putting a lid on it and then wondering why when you get home, you, you're eating the pantry or you go through the drive through and, you know, eating all the food, like, because you can't hold it. And, yeah. and I love how you said that good girl narrative, like good girls don't get mad. And the mm -hmm. also too, I think, and I was talking about this on a podcast recently, I, I was guessing, I can't remember which one it was, otherwise I'd link it, but anger is a very externally expressed emotion uh, and it can be seen or felt or sensed but it's usually at others it can be at yourself but you, you know, I'm angry at that person for cutting me off in traffic I'm angry at my kids for never putting their um stuff s dishes in the sink I'm angry at my husband for always dropping a towel on the floor like whatever you know um but guilt is an internally directed emotion. So when mm. we can't feel comfortable with an external, with expressing or having a difficult conversation, like I work with people with boundaries, if you're not able to say, you know, could you please pick up after yourself or like however you word the conversation, like reminding people of their responsibilities in, in the household and then you, you're holding that. If you go and eat an entire pack of biscuits, then you feel guilty. Like I'm the fat, lazy fuck who can't keep my shit together that is easier for many people to experience because mm -hmm. it's that self. Whereas something like if my kids, it's like, well, they're little, they don't understand or, or, you know, they're having nightmares or something that's, it's not a, like, then it's not a fun thing. And I feel bad for feeling mad at them for keeping me up <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But if I eat stuff, then I feel guilty at me. And that's easier for many of us to, to, um, sit with definitely and it's i think it's a it's a real like somatic nervous system response so i find a lot of women they feel a lot safer kind of fawning and people ple the people pleasing aspect which is exactly what you're talking about the guilt the internalizing the making it how do i manipulate myself and change myself so that this external thing either goes away or I feel safe with it and it feels comfortable, essentially. And I think that's why anger is so valuable because it is the predator response within us. It is oh, the part of us that. that is like the powerful, agile, like panther within us that we don't let come out because of everything you said. It feels terrifying like it genuinely feels scary to our system and so it's much easier to hide away to feel guilty to eat your feelings or to like not actually see your friends to just do so many or things to shop to add everything into your cart on amazon and then the next day going oh Whatever it is whoa <laughs> when all this stuff or to arrives. make yourself so busy as well that like you you know you you do busy work instead of doing the things that are really meaningful and important to you, like writing, like creating the boundaries around your life to be able to do what you actually want to do. There's two things that you've touched on. Um, the first, I'll come back to the anger is the fight response because that really resonated. But the busy work, how many people, and if you're listening to this and this is you, comment, tag us, let us know. 
never have time to do the things you really want to do, like write the book or you know, maybe even read the book. Like you might have this entire library of things that you buy, but you never make time to read, finish that course, do that painting, go for that walk, go to the gym. The things that you want to do for you have no time for. But the second someone else says, could you just, you have all the time in the world for them or as you said, for the busy work, it's like I've color coded this or I've, you know the things that don't even matter. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's into the the fawn response, like because it's easier to fall back on or to be like a, wholly available for others. Whereas the fight response, which is you know the anger or whatever, or the fire to do the thing, um, we're not as conditioned or familiar or comfortable mm-hmm. in that space. No, because it it requires being seen. It requires taking up space. It requires being visible. And for women, that's really scary. You know, for a lot of people, it's really scary. And but especially in this kind of conditioning where, you know, even like not even that long ago, people were accused of witchcraft or, (laughs) you know, they couldn't actually provide for themselves unless they were liked and could attract a husband all these kind of things make it within our very bones that it's difficult to access that. And so this is so often, um, you know, we were talking about having the boundaries to create stuff that you want. That's why I, I think of intuition work as boundary work, because your intuition is the bit of you that wants to explore what your soul desires, what your heart wants. And having a boundary around that and also consenting to intuition is the boundary work so i started with tarot cards that's the way i started getting in touch with my intuition and i was terrified to begin with because all the narratives i had heard kind of about intuition work and magic they were all a little scary it was very much like the universe does stuff to you like shit happens to you and you know, you pull a death card and it's scary, all of these kind of things. And what helped me feel safe around that was knowing that I had a say. So whenever I would go and pull cards, it was, I am willingly choosing to enter this relationship and I am allowed to say yes or no whenever I feel like it. And that's where I started practicing. That was my smallest step towards practicing my boundaries within my own sphere that slowly built outwards. But if I pulled a card that made me feel scared, I would say, no, thank you right now. And I'd put it back and pull another. And that was fine. That's how I began while I was still opening up to how my intuition wanted to communicate with me. And so for people who are listening, who find it really difficult to access their intuition, creating that space for you while you feel safe to access your intuition, I find is often the first step that is the strongest thing to actually creating that open channel within yourself. I love that. And the other thing too, for anyone listening. So I grew up in a very Catholic household and anything for the tarot was like, Oh, it's the devil's work. So I remember when I first started looking at cards and they were Oracle. So basically anything where you're using a, a medium to connect you to, you know, your intuition or whatever can be viewed in certain circumstances as, you know, the devil's work or bad or wrong or, you know, as you were saying earlier, there were times in the past where we burnt people at stake. So for doing things differently And it's like, but then again, what I always found amusing too is my family always loved reading their, what do you call it, a horoscope. So in a Mm -hmm. Sunday paper, they'd be reading the horoscope. And I I find cards kind of like that, as in when I draw a card, I like how you said, if you don't like the message, you put it back, you can choose to do another one. For me, if I draw a card, because I'm just literally looking at one in front of me on my desk, sometimes it's the, it's a color. Or sometimes it's something on the card, like an image, like trusting that the the message might not be. Because the thing is, when you think about it, the words, if there's a if it's a deck that has a book with it, it's somebody's interpretation of the message. Mm-hmm. So you know, and they say a picture's worth a thousand words. 
And none of those messages are a thousand words long. So what do you need to get from it? Like, so sometimes if I draw the same card multiple days in a row and it happens, I used to get really frustrated. Sometimes it is the sign, like maybe there's a message (laughs) I'm not wanting to receive. But other times it's like, if a picture's worth a thousand words, you could draw that same card a thousand days in a row and get something different from there because there's so many elements in it. And and mm-hmm. however you choose to to do that and access that and connect with that, it's up to you. And finding spaces and, and people you can work with, you know, coaches, communities where you can discuss these things and find out the practice or the way to connect that works for you. Because, you know, yeah. I'd never thought about until we had this conversation of drawing another card that had never occurred to me. It was like, no, no, this is the card. It's up to me to find the interpretation that feels aligned. But yeah, you could just go, I'm going to pick something else. This one feels too much today or not right today. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I love, I love what you said about repeating cards because I completely agree with you. The, the beauty, I think, of using tarot and oracle decks and these kind of things to access our intuition is um, that it accesses a part of a brain that isn't the conscious ego language part of our mind. You know, symbolism, it's older than humanity. Like it's just speaks to these archetypes and these myths that have been passed down through generations and generations. And that you don't even realize you're pulling the context, the unconscious context in when you read it. And that's what makes it so powerful and so i love it just love it so much <laughs> and the but, thing is the um, symbolism yeah. as you said like the, the time before we had written language we had hieroglyphics we had drawings we had you know um mm-hmm. carvings and etchings and also too what i love about it so to, at the time of recording this today my children and i went to the movies the movie was exactly the same it played for everybody in the cinema but each of us there had a completely different experience I was kind of like, yeah, it's all right. But, you know, my daughter was like, this is the best movie ever. And my son was like, he wasn't quite where I was. He enjoyed it, but he wasn't like waiting for it to come out on Disney or whatever. And it can be the same with the cards. So sometimes in in my program, I wait, depending on the cohort and the people, if they're comfortable to, in the coaching calls, we can draw a card. And I always hold it up and I ask people what they see. And it's fascinating because we're all looking at the same card and somebody will go, oh, look at the moon. And I'll be like, there's a moon? hadn't even noticed that or yeah. some and even like because then we t- you can get to I'm going to sidetrack but anyway you know when you get a new car and you're so excited and you're like oh my goodness or a new top or whatever it is and you're like oh. and then you see it everywhere and you're like what everybody has this because your reticular activating system the part of your brain that goes for pattern recognition is on the lookout for it so you know sometimes and and that can be also manipulated with modern marketing is if you google something and then a cookie and then they suddenly get advertised it for like the next month but it's you know when you are accessing a tool like a card or whatever it is to help as you said get in touch with the unconscious or the message that's there that you know you may be perhaps not seeing and then if you do it in community or group seeing other people's interpretation of it is so good because it's like, oh, that was literally there. And I I was totally unaware until you brought attention to it. And I think it helps to encourage how your unique experience of it is also so valuable. Like there isn't just one way to interpret it. People bring their own, their whole life experience and everything that they have touched and melded with essentially to creating an interpretation that's aligned for them and this is you know you asked what am I over and this is another thing that I'm very over is people thinking that intuition is just there or not that it's just like something that you're born with or like whatever or you don't have it when like it is a skill it is something that you can cultivate and that you can continue to hone and over time becomes stronger like so many people say oh I just I must not have it or they'll freak out if they're not hearing super clear intuitive messages when in reality like you wouldn't expect to be really good at playing the piano the first time that you sit down and play the piano and intuition is the same you can cultivate it and it can become clearer and clearer 
And everybody has a different way that their intuition wants to communicate with them. You know, some people are very visual, some people are very oral, some people um, prefer to free write, some people will have visions drop in, some people will hear things, sometimes it's just a physical sensation. There are just millions of ways that your intuition communicates with you. And the fun part is that you get to discover that yourself. It's like dating yourself again. It's awesome. I love that way because it kind of reminds me of languages. Like mm-hmm. on the world, how many languages do we have? Like I have I have no idea. But if we meet somebody and we don't speak the same language, we don't freak out that there's something fundamentally wrong with either of us. We're just like, oh, we aren't on the same page. It was funny, as we were recording, when we went to hit record at the beginning of this session, there was something wrong with the sound. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we might just have to do this via intuitive, uh, interpretive dance. <laughs> and then Chris Dan's not here, so we've got the the prop. But it was kind of like there was no stage there that I was panicking that this show wasn't going to go ahead. We'll figure it out. And I think, you know, when you talk about your intuition, if you just know I have it, but I don't know in which shape, in which language it's going to communicate to me in, like as you said, some people have visions, I don't see shit. I never have. And it's so funny because I'm a hypnotherapist. So um, in my programs and in my coaching, I talk people through, you know, hypnosis. And I always say, whatever you do or don't see is perfect. And Mm -hmm. some people at the end will tell me the most beautiful descriptions of things and then other people not. And then sometimes when we are the quieter one and and whatever, we might not speak up because we might invalidate our own experience. Like, oh, I didn't see a treasure chest, so I must have done it wrong. And then we, because we're so focused on wanting to see because others are seeing, we miss that we might be feeling or knowing or hearing or connecting in whatever way that we connect. And I loved earlier how you talked about, you know, taking up space. It's in a community or in a place where you can relearn that um, so that you can connect in with the way that you receive your messages, guidance, um, intuitive hits, nudges, whatever you want to call them. Also too, whatever you want to call them. Because everybody calls them different things. Exactly. And my one of the things that I find a lot of people um, really struggle with is this idea of, am I just making it up? Like, is this just made up? Am I being silly? And I love this so much because it's so human to do that. <laughs> when we make up everything all the time, and it has very real life consequences. So like the very um, direct one that I always give is like an engineer, will someone have to come up with a bridge for the very first time? Like they had to invent how to make a bridge. They had to invent how to make an airplane. They had to invent all of these things. And first, the very first step is imagining it. And we discount how incredibly powerful our imagination is that to impact real life especially with intuition that will just say oh that's just silly oh i'm just making it up but millions of stories architecture real life things are all created from the incredible power of the human imagination a hundred percent and i love that too because systems things that we have that are just like, I'm just thinking about, so when I was young, we didn't have computers in the classroom. Like there was computers on the world, but they weren't like day to day. We didn't have them at home. We certainly didn't have smartphones or anything like this. And my children asked me recently, they're learning to type. They're Mm -hmm. seven and nine. And they, and I said, I didn't learn to type until I was nearly 16. And they're like, what? What? (laughs) And I was like, we didn't have a computer. So the, to them, they can't even fathom yeah. not having. And I'm, I'm like, when I was a kid, there was like three stations of television. We had one TV in the house. There was none of these devices. and Like it was yeah. th- that could not comprehend. But all of these things came. They were envisaged. Envisaged? It's late, people. <laughs> <Envisioned>. <laughs> the time of recording this. <laughs> but, you know, they were imagined first. But the other thing, too, that you said that I will just take it on a slight tangent. Am I just making it up? I do automatic writing. So it's something, you know, it's one of the things that you touched on briefly. I know when it's me, like everyday Suze versus if it's thing, when I read back over it, 
Everyday mm. Suze is judgmental as fuck. <laughs> like the tonality yeah. of what I've written when it's me, am I just making this up? I think this is whatever versus it's when I'm mm-hmm. connecting to something else. I like to think of it as my higher self. Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, me personally, but the language, the way that we communicate when we're um open to something as opposed to, cause like, think about it. Do you ever talk to anyone else the way you talk to yourself? Chances are no. So the, when you have these things and also too, what Denise Litchfield recommends, which I have taken to this day is keep a, a journal, a Google doc notes on your phone, something like evidence. So when you mm-hmm. have a nudge, like don't drive home that way. And then you later find out, oh, there was an accident or buy this one and not that one. And then you find this product was recalled or whatever it is. Note that down so that when you are having those moments, am I just making this up? Is this real? You can read back over your evidence and go, here is all the ways that my intuition gave me an inkling that I followed. Um, Or when it goes the other way, when you ignore it and then you're stuck in traffic, it's always traffic with me. I'm driving and I'm like, no, this way is faster. And then I'm like, oh, it's not. (laughs) So it's like, have that evidence. And then that reminds you that when you get that little nudge to follow it yes uh and also i want to add on to that coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning is that sometimes following a nudge will not take you where your ego thinks you oh. want to go oh yes tell us more so <laughs> an example that i have is that it was a few years ago i um i bought a course from this coach it was a year-long membership and from the first call And I got a very intuitive yes to go for it. And the first call, I just knew it wasn't right for me. And I remember going through this massive spiral of like, oh my God, can I not trust my intuition? Like it was so clear to come here, like what the hell? And I had to go through this, it felt like a very painful process at the time, but it was a real reclaiming of my own authority and my own wisdom and being able to say, like, actually, this person doesn't know better than me for what I need. And actually, I'm going to step away from this. And that was a radical, powerful moment that I really needed that I th- and I thought it was going to go a totally different way. <laughs> I thought I was going to join this yellow membership. It was going to give me everything that I needed. I was going to have like a super successful business by the end of the year. And that is not what happened. And instead, also, not only did I learn the essential skill that one needs as an entrepreneur, which is to listen to myself more than other people, but I also met someone who felt the same way in that group. And we decided to set up weekly calls. And this person has become like my most close friend and these weekly calls have become the most nourishing, supportive parts of my week. And so this is, this is something that wasn't clear to both of us when we had both said yes intuitively to this course and then realized that actually it was a no. It, we had no idea how it would have panned out. But that's how you came across each other. So that, and I think how many times in our life, all of us, our ego, as you said, is expecting a result. At the end of this, I'm going to be skinny, rich, famous, bought the house, yes. live on an island, whatever. And then yeah. we don't have that. I'm like, oh, what's the point? And the example <laughs> I can think of is so I, I am a uh, <laughs> hummingbird, as my husband calls me. It's like I get really passionate about something. I do it for a bit and then I flit off to something else. And it's funny <laughs> you mentioned engineers before because he's an engineer, has been his whole career, probably will be for his entire thing. Jackhammer, Jackhammer, hummingbird. <laughs> On one of my flits, I decided that I was going to be a teacher. So I enrolled in a diploma of education, only to find I did not want to be a teacher. But what was funny is I met someone else, similar to how you said, who Mm. also did not want to be a teacher. So we didn't get the career that we thought out of the program, but we met each other, been lifelong friends, great connections. Mm. And it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, the universe, source, God, whatever you want to call it, the, the the messenger is delivering you the thing, the thing that you need, but it's yeah. not necessarily in the way, shape or form that you thought. Like how many times have you done something and it's just been like, well, this didn't work out, um, mm-hmm. but something better came along as a result of what I learned from this. Yeah. 
Exactly, and I think so much of, um, there's a fine line to straddle with this where you don't always want to be, like, I think this is the part where it can fall into toxic positivity, where you're saying there's always a silver lining for something, which I don't believe in. I don't think there's a reason for everything. Um, sometimes shitty stuff just happens. <laughs> um, but when you are closing yourself off, when you think there is only one result, you miss so much and this is what we were talking about before about selectively numbing you know yes. it's when you allow yourself to be open to your present experience and to what is actually being presented to you that is when you get to see the magic in it yes and, and you might not see it till so much later change. no that's true because that's I'm, true. I'm thinking personally i got fired in 2017 mm -hmm. which at the time yeah. was like life-shatteringly bad and yeah in hindsight, it was like, I never would have started my own business. I wouldn't have had the stones. I wouldn't have had the wherewithal. I wouldn't have had the gumption to be like, no, mm -hmm. I'm no longer like this. This is my show. <laughs> but at the time, yes. it was the biggest, most terrible, most awful thing. So sometimes, you know, hindsight, like, you know, they say life is lived forward and understood backwards. So, mm -hmm. you know, the argument, the dismissal, the thing that at the time, like, as you said, sometimes things are just shit, like, you know, shit things happen. But as a result of who you become from working your way mm -hmm. through that often opens yeah. doors that you might not even be aware were even linked to that thing. Yeah, exactly the same for me. I Five years ago, I was in a very well-paid, well-respected finance job. And leaving that uh, gave me a massive identity crisis. And I had no idea how to listen to my intuition at that point. Like no clue, didn't trust myself, completely filled with self-doubt and having that security blanket of the job title and the salary taken away from me i thought was the worst thing that could have happened to me and instead it made like five years later <laughs> i realize what a powerful moment that was that led me on the path of my trusting myself really liking myself as well and owning the skills and abilities that i do have that weren't being utilized in that space i love that so much and the, and the title and the secure you know inverted commas secure paycheck because it's it's funny that as i said my husband the jackhammer who's had you know secure jobs all through his career it's amazing the things that have happened as in like the company has gone bankrupt so mm. he's been made redundant or um with the uptake of solar power he's an engineer hasn't needed as much electricity hasn't had, had a job so even the things that, are, that look on the outside like so secure Yes. Uh, necessarily and also the title too it's like who is the title for is it for your ego mm -hmm. i'm at this <laughs> versus like I do that. What, what even is that because it's so funny i remember my kids my son saying to one of his friend's mums that i was a coach it's like oh what what sports team and i was like oh well um doesn't get coaching as it is but it's kind of like the title whereas if it's like oh no she's a surgeon or something like i stayed with medical mm. school what about oh yes it's the title but I didn't love enliven my soul. <laughs> no, and I, I didn't, it's only now that I'm out of it. Do I realize like how miserable I was at the time? Because you don't, sometimes you don't realize when you're in it. And I personally felt very ashamed that I wasn't feeling super happy because I was doing everything right. You know, I had a good salary. I was like, I'd done a whole bunch of certifications that made me look really good. Like I was doing the thing. And so I thought, well, something must be wrong with me. Like I must yes. be broken that I can't enjoy this. And so like the fact that my intuition just led me in so many different places, I am so grateful because the life that I have built for myself today, I am so in love with, and it doesn't look like anything that I thought it should have looked like <laughs> when I first set out on this journey, but it's something that satisfies me day to day and that love is that. something I couldn't have imagined previously how does it look like to the outside versus how does it feel inside like I've worked with I don't know how many weight loss clients who in the initial few sessions they'll bring me a photo or they'll show me an image and go like I want to look like this like if mm -hmm. only I was as skinny as when I thought I was fat and then I just asked some questions like, you know, how did you feel? I was working out four hours a day. I was living on kale smoothies. I was miserable. I had no friends. My partner was like, could you just eat a slice of bread, please? Like, 
But looking back at the photos, I looked amazing, but I didn't, I felt like shit. And I think, you know, there can be that with a title. There can that be with the job. There can be like, I did the thing. I have the husband and the house and the two and a half kids and the picket fence. And so I must just be ungrateful or I must just be selfish. Yes. And then I soothe and numb with these things. And it's like, but the things that I feel called to do don't make any logical sense. So I don't want to do those because that feels weird. Mm -hmm. Yes. And oh, that ungrateful piece, that's the piece where tie back to the anger response and the predator like instinct within us because for so long that idea of like you're being ungrateful is so heavily used on women to keep them in fawn response to keep them in that little people pleasing place it's like why aren't you just being grateful for everything that you have and then you just spiral in that place of like i'm not good enough but when you start to allow that rage and allow that other stuff to come through is when I think you kind of break through that and you're like you know what I can be grateful and want more exactly and I think the from that that's the basis of true transformation it's like mm -hmm. it's not in this total lack of I'm not good enough I'm never going to have enough because from that place we just push the goalpost back we yes. lose the weight and we go, oh, I don't feel it better. Must need to be another five kilos and can lead mm -hmm. into big eating disorders or must need to get more toned, which can lead into, you know, exercise and injury, all sorts of things, or must need more money. Like, you know, but if it's the point, as you said, like I am not where I want to be. Like being ungrateful is not necessarily a bad thing. I desire more. Um, not from the toxic gloss over, I should be happy where I am. And just, as you said, it's a way to keep us in the fawn response. I love that frame to be like, I can have this and I desire more and yeah. not making yourself wrong for that. No, and think about how demonized women's desire is in life generally, you know, like you're not allowed to sexualize yourself, but other people should be able to sexualize you. And you're not allowed to say that you want things. You just have to be meek and, this is what I think intuition is such a beautiful um, blend of leading you towards your desires. I said this earlier, and it's, it brings you closer and closer to them by helping you become the kind of person who has the capacity to really claim, this is what I want. Yeah. I love that. That's it's like a reclamation. A yes. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to appear too sexy or I don't want to appear too salesy or I don't want to appear like this. And it's yes. like, uh, this is my job. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm going to look like I'm selling something. Like, you yeah. know, can you imagine going to the hospital? Don't appear too doctory. Like set my arm, <laughs> but don't look too doctory. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, gosh. It's it. well, amazing, thank you so the much, limitations. Julia. I could talk to you all day. It's been fabulous. But before we wrap up, I know you have a new offer. Please tell the listeners how, first of all, how they can connect with you. And second of all, what your new offer is and what it entails, because I want to know too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can connect with me on Instagram, which is juliamazzola.x. The spelling of my name is the Italian spelling. So it's G-I-U-L-I-A and then M-A-Z-Z-O-L-A. And um, my new offer is called the Imagineer Academy. And oh, it can you say that again? Sorry. The Imagineer Academy. Mm. Yes. So it is five months of one on one coaching. It's kind of a private magical mentorship on how you can turn your imaginative superpower into real life action so that uh, whole idea of being able to tap into your intuitive gifts and really use that to guide your way and to really make decisions and take action that feel aligned and become the real experimenter in your life so imagineers is a term that disney used that was um how they named their engineers that were making really cool solutions for the theme parks and um, I checked, it's not copyrighted. <laughs> um, imagineering is essentially that using your imagination to create real life solutions. So that's- I love that. Uh, if people want to know more about that, that'll be on your website or? That'll be on my website, um, which is www.juliamazzola.com. Perfect. And I'll put all the links in the show notes. One more question before we wrap up. Do you know much about 
how Walt Disney came to do his business. Ooh, do you know how many no. times he was turned down for a loan before he managed to go how ahead? How many? Have a guess. Ten? More. Thirty? Mm-hmm. Thirty. <laughs> See, she's got good intuition, people. <laughs> the thing is, the reason I really want to highlight that for, for yourself, for the yeah. listeners, are you, as we wrap up, sometimes when we don't get what we want straight away, like when you were talking about the ego and things, then we end up, it's not meant for me. I'm not good enough. Like we all have it. Like I do this too. But often I wonder if it's actually in service to us because who do we become each time we show up? Can you imagine going to the bank? No, sorry, Mr. Disney. Like this sounds ridiculous. No, not giving you a loan. Like to go back, how many of us would go back 29 more times? Like we might go back, you know, say, I mean, I, I reckon I've got a lot of grit, but I don't know if I could hear 29 no's and turn up again. Like get my suit out and press it and walk in the door. Like I don't, I don't think even I could do that. But the thing is, even once he had Disneyland, it wasn't smooth sailing. Like imagine how Not many at all. people he would have had to deal with who had complaints or injuries or felt ripped off or whatever. But because he'd gotten over being told no 29 times before he got the yes, he had a level of grit that he needed to become Walt Disney. And as we're wrapping up and as you're listening to this episode, think about a goal that you've tried in your life, whether it be weight loss, start a business, save money. I don't know what it is. You will know that you've tried however many times and you think this is just not meant to be. Maybe in the times of you not getting there, it's you becoming the grit that when you have the thing, who you've become along the way, then the smooth sailing comes or your abil- inability to be rattled by what before. Like imagine in first loan, yeah, you've got this. And then some shit goes down with engineers or whatever. And it's like, I don't know how to handle this. Quit. Like who you become in your attempts shapes going forward so much smoother than if everything went your way straight up. Yeah. And I actually will add on to that a little exercise that you can do listening yes, to please. this is that when you going through that exercise of like what has actually happened, actually take the time to write out what skill did you learn from doing that? So perhaps like Walt Disney going to the bank is like learning how to um, phrase his request, learning how to not take no as an answer, learning how to be with disappointment and rejection an essential skill for an entrepreneur <laughs> learning and how all these to kind of things be clear on your offer and what it's actually what's on mm. the other side of it yes. learning how to like and, and for anything that you've done you might not have the goal but what as you said line item by line item what did yeah. you learn how have you become more skilled even if it didn't bring you the result that you hoped like you know, whether it be a, a uni degree or a class or a program that you did that you didn't finish or whatever, and you just like did not finish, have, you know, rejected. Like, what did you learn along the way? There's so much value in that. I love it. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you. for listening. If you have enjoyed these episode, please share it up. I would really love for you to share it. Tag us on Instagram. Um, share it with your friends, leave us a rating or a review. If you're not much of a review writer, just give us five stars for the cred like an Uber. I'd absolutely love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.